Good morning, I'm Jim Thomas. I'm the Director of Studies at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. And uh, let me start just by um, thanking uh, my colleagues from uh, uh, the other think tanks from AEI and CNAS and from CSIS. Uh, and I also want to recognize my colleagues at CSBA uh, who uh, participated in uh, this exercise with me on, on our team as we were putting this together um, and who are, who are mentioned here on the slide. Let me start, uh, what I'd like to do in, in this presentation is uh, first walk through how we thought about the security environment and then turn to or the strategic approach we adopted and highlight from that strategic approach uh, some of the, the derivative uh, moves we made in terms of programmatics. Um, and, and then I'd like to conclude where I think all good strategy was, and hopefully the QDR will be doing this in a few weeks, which is really talking about, okay, well, where are we in fact taking risk? Let me start with the, the security environment. Um, I think it really is a fool's errand to try to predict the future uh, looking 20 years out. You know, if you think back to the 1997 QDR uh, in terms of the things that were emphasized, we're, we're not quite at that point, uh, but, but we probably weren't gonna get it right. And, and I think that that's, that's just a reality we have to face. Nevertheless, I think there are three enduring challenges that are listed on this slide, um, which I think have been with us and they will continue to be with us, uh, and they may continue to intensify over the next 20 years. Uh, and these are the ones I think we have to be the most prepared for. Thinking about revisionist states uh, like China or Iran or Russia, they're gonna be challenging regional status quos, they're developing anti-access postures and area denial postures, and they're developing limited means of power projection uh, within their areas. Weapons of mass destruction threats, nuclear, biological, and chemical, uh, as well as uh, the enduring irregular threats that are going to be with us. Uh, we may not be interested in counterinsurgency or large-scale stability operations, but irregular warfare is going to remain uh, interested in us, and so we're going to have to continue to be prepared to meet those challenges. Meeting those challenges, however, has to occur against, uh, with, with a backdrop, with two things in our minds. The first is obviously the fiscal backdrop, uh, that we're just going to be do doing, uh, addressing these challenges in a period of more constrained resources. The second is that technologically we see the barriers to entry are falling uh, for, for, for many key military technologies like precision guided weaponry or supercomputing or, or robotics and autonomy. Uh, which is leveling the playing field in some respects, or it's enabling hybrid warfare where even very low-tech and unsophisticated adversaries can adopt uh, an, a, bits and pieces of very high-tech means uh, that, that we'll face. The bottom line here is that power projection as we've done it traditionally is just going to get a lot harder as we look to the future. So in light of the security environment, in light of our fiscal challenges, as well as uh, falling uh, technological barriers to entry, this is the strategic approach that my colleagues and I adopted at CSBA uh, for thinking through um, how we would rebalance our forces looking ahead. We want to maintain access to, vital, uh, to areas that are vital overseas, uh, regions like the Persian Gulf or in East Asia or in Europe. Um, and we want to prevent the domination of those same regions uh, by, by hostile powers. The, the big takeaway here is that as we look out over the next couple decades, we see a world for our military forces that is going to be far less permissive than the world we've come from over the last couple decades. It's going to be harder for us to project our military uh, transoceanically. It's going to be harder to operate in theaters uh, in the face of uh, guided rockets, artillery, mortars and missile systems, and other capability, anti-access and area denial systems. Uh, and it's going to be harder to sustain that force with the logistics and the communication, telecommunications postures that we have that are extant. So we saw that we were going to need to make a big change. And at the same time, we really wanted to think about how we'd maximize combat strike power in the years ahead. So this brought us to thinking about um, how we would make a big shift. And this really gets to the heart of the strategy, is shift, the shift from a compellence force to a more deterrence force. And let me talk a little more about that. <laughs> We want to stay in the power projection business as a superpower as we look ahead. But what we realize is if you think back to every force planning construct since the end of the Cold War, they're all about compellence. And by that, what I mean is they're about how we coerce somebody to stop doing what they're doing. Uh, how do we serve eviction notices to Saddam Hussein when he invades Iraq? We've been optimizing our joint force for precisely that problem for the last 20 years. 
So everyone wants to change a forest planning construct, but we can never figure out how do we break past the, the gravitational pull of a current construct. I think this is the problem. It's because we've been trying to figure out how do we continue doing compellents. So as we look ahead, you know, we're reminded of what uh, Thomas Schelling once told us, which is it's easier to deter than it is to, 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 than it is to compel. And we really tried to adopt that as the, as the central organizing principle for the rebalancing work that we would do. We wanted to think about how can we punish multiple opportunistic aggressors at the same time while denying them their objectives around the world. We wanted the ability with, with, with one system to be able to deter multiple parties simultaneously. At the same time that we want to be able to punish uh, potential aggression, we also want to be able to prevent it or deny it in the first place. So we also put a lot more emphasis on denial capabilities, both those that would reside within the US military as well as those that we could encourage our, adver our allies and our partners to develop as well. So let me start by talking about some of the key, what I'd call punishment forces that we were uh, intent on either maintaining or, or, or expanding. First and foremost is our nuclear posture, which in a period of austerity, we looked at it not as much as a bill pair, but hearkening back to the, to the Eisenhower administration, you may put even greater emphasis on your nuclear forces in a time of austerity th than you might otherwise. So we maintained the triad. We pursued uh, improvements for the uh, B-61 gravity bomb, and we looked at making modifications for dual capable aircraft. At the same time, we thought about how we would maximize the Joint Force's ability to conduct conventional uh, long-range strikes. This is not just a question of bombers, uh, albeit they're, they're critically important and we wanted to uh, pursue uh, uh, the LRSB program, but it was looking at how we would conduct strikes from undersea with new intermediate-range ballistic missiles that would be uh, sea-based as well as even if we were to withdraw from the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, land-based missile forces that could be used to conduct deep strikes against our adversaries. We also saw that the, the, the simple truth of the matter today is that we, um, our, our munitions inventory is just too shallow. Uh, we really are going to need to max out our munitions inventories uh, for the future to be able to demonstrate that we can hold thousands of aim points globally at risk on a continual basis. So we were looking at new weapon systems that we could pursue, weapon systems that would allow us with things like high-powered microwaves, not just to hold a single target at risk, but to be able with a single weapon to hold multiple targets at risk. And at the same time, we wanted to increase our stocks of precision-guided weapons that would be land-based, air-based, or sea-based. And finally, we looked at special operations as, as part of our arsenal of how we potentially could punish uh, aggression and coercion around the world not only in terms of direct action, but even more importantly, perhaps, in terms of special warfare or unconventional warfare, being able to hold out the risk of unconventional regime change by being able to work with indigenous partners in places in the world to impose costs or to overturn uh, dis uh, despotic regimes. Let me now switch to talking a little bit about the denial forces that we emphasized. Here, it was a big, we placed a big emphasis in our portfolio rebalancing on sea denial forces, uh, offensive mine warfare capabilities that uh, for the longest time we really have gotten out of the business of, of pursuing, uh, new unmanned underwater vehicles, uh, both that could uh, deliver torpedoes as well as mines, uh, as well as trying to maximize our undersea payload uh, through a new uh, family of undersea systems, manned submarines with greater payload through things like the Virginia payload module, as well as towed payload modules that could be brought into denied areas. And at the same time, we wanted to complement these capabilities with both land uh, and, and, and air-launched capabilities as well in, in, in the form of anti-ship missiles. On the ground, a big emphasis on air denial capabilities. Uh, and, and here we saw new roles and missions potentially for the Army in terms of air and missile defense as well as getting back into the business of coastal defense and, and fielding anti-ship capabilities. Uh, and then finally, again, the, the deep strike capability in theater.
Let me just talk uh, and turn really quick, given the time, and just talk about how one of the things that we thought was important is not just fielding weapon systems, but how would we enable what's going to in inevitably be a smaller force, but in a way that we might be able to provide even greater combat on, on station uh, time for combat forces in theater. And we thought about this in two ways. The first is we need new divisions of labor with our allies. Um, in, in, increasingly, our allies are going to be the first responders uh, for dealing with aggression or coercion in their areas. We want to encourage them to do the same sorts of things that uh, states like China and, 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 and others have done. We want them to grow uh, friendly anti-access and area denial complexes uh, to defend their own sovereignty, uh, to be the first line of defense in, 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 in their own interest. Uh, this does two things. One, it makes them harder targets and less susceptible uh, to, to any sort of aggression, but it also helps to provide U.S. forces with sanctuary so we can better enter the theater. The second is we, we made a big investments when it came to logistics. This isn't a sexy area. There's not a big, large constituency for it. There aren't a lot of special interests that go out and push logistics. But we saw it was critically important. If we're going to have a smaller force, it has to be more logistically capable uh, for combat operations. So we, in particular, we emphasized improving our uh, uh, submarine infrastructure and potentially creating new basing options overseas for our submarine forces, as well as increasing uh, the number of submarine tenders that support that force. We also expanded the combat logistics fleet, uh, right-sizing it uh, to, to be able to support forward naval operations. And last but not least, we developed a new capability for, uh, for doing at-sea rearming of vertical launch system tubes so we could, again, increase uh, uh, the on-station time of our combat forces. So la last slide is really getting to the issue of where did we take risk uh, to do all this? And it really goes back to the theory of the case, is if we're making the shift from a compellence force more towards a global deterrence force, the risk we take really come out of that compellence force. Um, we're taking risks when it comes to relinquishing on-demand capacity for large-scale stability operations or being able to conduct simultaneous combat operations to compel another country uh, to withdraw its forces in an invasion or, or similar type scenarios. Um, this meant we were reducing uh, both the active and reserve components of the Army. We were uh, reducing the reserve component of the Marine Corps and also taking away a lot of the Marine Corps, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, second land army uh, capabilities uh, in terms of its heavy forces. And we were divesting from the Air Force and the Navy legacy tac uh, tactical aircraft systems. We, made, uh, we did have to cut readiness uh, despite uh, our, our desire not to, but we didn't cut it anywhere like the cuts that, if you, if you recall, last May of 2013, in the first exercise we did like this, those cuts were far deeper, almost an order of magnitude deeper. And last but not least, we're really talking about taking some risks in terms of what people might think of as visible presence. Uh, that when people say, you know, the carrier is a symbol of American forward presence and that's what our allies want, I think part of this is a Pavlov's dog, a dog problem that we're going to have to work, work through. It's really not presence, visible presence, that countries are going to want perhaps as much in the future as it is comprehensive deterrence from the United States in terms of combat, uh, credible combat power that we can provide. So on that, I'll end there and look forward to your questions in the discussion. Thank you.